The standard chuck that comes with this lathe is a 4 inch diameter 3 jaw. And I say 4 inch, but it's uh, that's the approximate equivalent in inches, but it's actually a metric specification. And in this case, it looks like it's 100 millimeters. So 100 millimeters is approximately 4 inches. Uh, now that's uh, an interesting thing because traditionally every mini lathe I've seen up until this one, and there's uh, been quite a few of them over the years, has had a 3 inch uh, diameter chuck as the stock chuck. And that turns out to be 80 millimeters. Uh, so this is the first one I've seen that comes standard with a 4 inch chuck and I think that's a great change because the 3 inch chuck Although it's a decent little chuck, it really is pretty limited in size and almost immediately after you start using your lathe you're going to wish you had a 4 inch. And in fact I've even used a 5 inch uh, chuck on my mini lathes and I think it's safe to do that if, as long as you take some safety precautions. But the 4 inch is probably the optimal size uh, for this lathe in my opinion. Now you can also of course remove this and put a 4 jaw chuck in place and it does not come with the 4 jaw but that's available as an accessory. So let's uh, take this off and look at the spindle behind it. To remove the chuck you need to take one of the standard included wrenches, in this case it's the 14 millimeter, but again on every other uh, mini lathe that I've seen the uh, nuts here typically are smaller than this and so this is kind of a, uh, a larger wrench than I'm used to using on the mini lathes. But you just uh, loosen those, maybe a quarter turn, and uh, once they're loosened, you can just spin them off. But let me uh, mention that when you first get your lathe from the factory, it's typical that these nuts are very, very tight, and you uh, are very likely to have to use the chuck key in place to hold the chuck while you gain extra leverage to uh, loosen these nuts for the first time. Now, they don't have to be super tight uh, when, you're, when in use, but they should be snugged up pretty firmly. Uh, but you don't need to over tighten them because they're not going to go anywhere. But they, they tighten them up extra tight at the factory so that during the uh, journey across the oceans and by truck and by uh, other moving things, you know, forklifts or whatever they use to move these along the journey from the factory to the end user, there's a good possibility that those could work loose. So they keep them extra tight uh, during shipping, but you don't need to keep them uh, super tight when you're using them in the shop. So just spin these three nuts off of here. Be careful not to drop them. And traditionally it's always been a, an awkward problem here to get your fingers back in the space because it's a very narrow space. And it looks to me like they may have enlarged this space a little bit. I'll check that on another lathe and uh, see if that's true or just my imagination. But once you've got those loosened you can just lift the chuck off. And it's a good idea, particularly when you're new to working at the lathe to put some kind of a protective board or a shop rag or something down in this area so that if you accidentally drop the chuck you don't gouge up your ways. Uh, well I was curious to see if this uh, gap or space here behind the spindle, between the spindle and the headstock, it seemed to me that it was bigger than uh, I'm used to experiencing on the mini lathe and I took a, a half inch diameter aluminum tube just, just as a measuring tool and check two other mini lathes that I currently have in the shop and sure enough on those two lathes the gap here is just a little tiny bit wider than this half inch diameter rod or tube I should say uh, whereas here I've got an extra quarter of an inch or so in there so I don't know whether that's a, a one-time thing on this particular lathe or whether that's actually an engineering change uh, common to this uh, model of the lathe but it's a, a nice feature because it gives you a lot more room to get your fingers and thumbs back here when you're trying to manipulate the nuts on the back of the uh, chuck. And I have kind of stubby fingers or fat fingers. It's always been a problem getting them back there for me. So we'll see. I don't know what to, what to report on that, but it, uh, it's a change that I like and I hope they stick with it. One interesting difference between this machine and all the other mini lathes I've ever looked at is that it has a 4 inch diameter spindle. We talked about the uh, 4 inch diameter st standard chuck that comes on it, so there's a matching spindle. On all the other mini lathes, if you want to use a chuck larger than 3 inch diameter, you have to have an adapter plate between the chuck and the spindle.
to match the larger diameter of the chuck to the smaller diameter of the spindle. But if we take a three inch four jaw chuck, as you would typically use or might use on a mini lathe, uh, this one, as you can see, doesn't fit any of the holes. So you have to go to a four inch four jaw chuck. But that's actually a good thing. The uh, three inch is probably a little undersized, in my opinion, anyway. And the uh, four inch four jaw chuck is uh, is a lot more versatile just because you have greater capacity. So there's the spindle and as you can see there's a central bore here which has a, a number three Morse taper I believe it is and uh, some of the lathes, not all of them, sometimes they come with a, a dead center that fits in here and I'll check the accessories box and see if there is one but there's a series of holes along here that made up with the three jaw chuck in this case Sometimes it's a little tricky to uh, figure out which set of holes goes with which type of chuck. But the second set of holes is for a four jaw chuck. So the four jaw chuck has the uh, holes arranged in a X or cross shape. And then the three jaw chuck shares one. This hole here is shared by both chucks. And you have three holes 120 degrees apart. One thing I like to do is to uh, take a sharpie pen or sometimes I use some uh, nail polish and just mark the three holes for the three jaw chuck that makes it easier when you go to put the chuck in place to match up these studs with the correct holes this uh, spindle has a little hole here that I'm not used to seeing I'm not quite sure what that does or what it's for but it does have kind of a sharp edge on it there so you've got to watch out you don't snag your finger on that and it might be something you want to touch up with a a little file or a stone to take that sharp edge off of there. But the spindle of course is the uh, main driven element of the lathe and the uh, it's also the registration of the chuck so the accuracy of the lathe depends a great deal on how precisely this surface here is finished and of course the quality of the bearings and the quality of the machining on the spindle itself. But We'll take a dial indicator in a minute here and uh, just do some readings on that and see how it looks. The other dimension I like to check for runout is the uh, surface of this boss or raised area here on the spindle because that's the registration surface that uh, engages with this recess on the back of the chuck and so it determines the uh, alignment of the chuck on the spindle. So if your spindle was uh, very concentric and had no very little runout if this surface was machined um, out of off center from that, then you could still have a fair amount of run out in the chuck because the chuck's going to register up against this surface. So it's useful to know uh, how that looks. And on this particular lathe, I haven't, I don't recall seeing this on other lathes, but there's a hole drilled here that creates a discontinuity in that surface. So I can't uh, run it around under power, but I can turn it by hand um, until I get to that gap there. And just doing that, it looks like there's maybe uh, maybe four tenths total run out along that surface, which is a little bit more than we measured down below here. But that's still not bad, and especially when you consider that the uh, on a typical low cost three jaw chuck like this, the jaws don't align any better typically than two or three thousandths, maybe even five thousandths uh, concentricity uh, when you close them down. So as long as this is a lot smaller uh, variance than you get from the chuck itself, you don't have anything to lose uh, as far as accuracy goes. Now the other thing is, even if your chuck was off by say five thousandths, which would be quite a lot for even for an inexpensive chuck, um, the workpiece, as soon as you start turning it, is going to be as concentric as your uh, spindle itself. So on this lathe, even if the chuck was a little bit off, you'd still get concentricity on the order of a few ten thousandths once you make your first cut. And we'll explain that later when we get into turning operations. So overall, that looks pretty good. Uh, certainly uh, well within the expectations on an inexpensive lathe like this. The other thing, though, of course, is that the if you're working on a long workpiece, it has to also pass through the center of the chuck. This is one of the uh, three inch chucks that have been standard on the mini lathe for many years and typically the hole uh, through the chuck is only about five-eighths of an inch in diameter uh, 
which is smaller than the three-quarter inch diameter of the spindle. So this becomes uh, sort of your limit on the chuck. However, on this lathe, uh, with the larger four-inch chuck, the spindle through hole is also larger and looks like it's about three-quarters of an inch, which is about the same as the spindle itself. So the chuck uh, through hole diameter doesn't limit you in this case. You're still limited, of course, to three-quarters of an inch, but that's better than on the, uh, uh, the smaller chucks that we've seen in the past. On this lathe, we can take a piece of three-quarter inch diameter stock and it will fit uh, easily through the through hole in the chuck and the through hole in the spindle. So that's nice. And I thought I would try that with a piece of uh, 7 8 inch diameter. And it will fit through up to a point, but it uh, runs into resistance as it gets back in here a little ways. So we'll take the chuck off and see what the holdup is. With the chuck removed, you can see that the 7 8 inch diameter stock will only fit a short distance through the spindle before the uh, taper of the spindle limits its uh, rearward movement. But still, if you had the uh, chuck mounted, you get a considerable amount of uh, length that you can work on, even with a 7 8 inch diameter piece of stock, and that's certainly a big improvement over the uh, previously standard stock 3 jaw chuck. Well, while we're on the subject of the chuck, the uh, standard three-jaw chuck comes with two sets of jaws. These uh, jaws that are in place typically when you receive it uh, are called the inside jaws. I'll explain why in a minute. And then there's this other set of jaws that are called the outside jaws, which typically uh, grip a workpiece on the outer surface. But the uh, inside jaws can also grip on the outside surface. And in fact, probably the most common uh, operating scenario on any lathe, and especially on the mini lathe, is just like this, where you have a, uh, a workpiece, in this case a half inch diameter aluminum rod, and you uh, just put it, position it between the jaws, tighten it down. I like to tighten uh, using two or all three positions, which I think just gives a more even grip on it and tends to center it a little better than if you just use one position. At least that's my theory, and I think that was taught to me. Uh, by someone who was a, a very experienced machinist, so I uh, trust his word on that. <clears throat> but uh, as you can see, it grips the outer surface of the work. Now you can also grip the inner surface, and let me uh, find a different work piece and I'll show you that. Sometimes you'll have a sort of a donut shaped work piece like this, and uh, it's too large to grip uh, with the jaws. If I were to try to extend the jaws out, they just drop out of place because they, they won't go out that far. But if the uh, diameter of the hole in the center here is large enough on some work pieces, you can grip them from the inside by moving the jaws outward and it will grip them. These uh, rounded surfaces on the outer face of the, uh, the jaws will grip the inner surface of the work piece. So you can uh, mount it adjust it up against these flats here to get it aligned and then just extend the jaws outward to hold it in place and I can now make a, a facing cut here or a turning cut if I needed to. So uh, there are actually two sets of these raised areas here that you can use on the jaws for that purpose. So you could hold a fairly large workpiece, maybe something four or five inches in diameter using that method. Now the, the lathe comes with this alternate set of jaws called the outside jaws. Uh, let me get the, the right set together here. And these are shaped a little bit differently. Let me compare this inside jaw here with uh, the outside jaws. Or I'm sorry, these are the inside jaws that we were using. These are the outside jaws that we're about to put in place. And they are also numbered and have to go in the right slot. So there's one, two, and three. So let me find slot number one and I'm looking down in the groove here uh, for those numbers. That looks like three. A little hard to see with the lighting here too. And this looks like number one. Actually it doesn't have a number one here. It has the uh, Chuck serial number in there. So that tells me that's the number one slot. So I find the number one jaw. Then I have to look down in here and turn it until I see the edge of the scroll. The leading edge of the scroll will come around. Then I want to put the jaw 
in position and push it firmly up against the scroll and while I apply some pressure with my thumb I start turning the chuck key to engage the scroll. That's I didn't get it. Uh, it can be a little tricky especially when you're new at it. Okay that time I got it locked in there. Now I turn it to uh, the slot for jaw number two and I find my number two jaw that's, that's number three. There's my number two jaw and I just repeat that and make sure that one's locked in there and jaw number three same thing. Now if you don't do it that way if you don't get them in the right sequence or you don't get them properly aligned what you'll find is when you tighten the jaws up they don't meet in the center one of them will be off off kilter it'll be skewed outward from the other two or uh, maybe one of them will be uh, closer in than the other two, but they won't meet in the center. So if that happens, just uh, wind them out again and start over. Make sure you do them in sequence one, two, three, and they should meet in the center. All right, now with the so-called outside jaws in place, I can take this same workpiece. In this case, instead of gripping on the inside surface, I'm gripping on the outside surface. And I assume that's why they're called outside jaws is because they're typically used to hold a workpiece on the outside surface. However, that's true for the inside jaws too, so that's a mystery to me. But uh, that's what they're called, and uh, you can see the difference, I think. Uh, so typically, if you have a larger diameter workpiece, you often will want to use the outside jaws uh, to hold it in place because it may be too large to hold with the inside jaws. So I can uh, extend this out and I can hold it on these inner surfaces. Uh, but it's best to keep the jaws uh, as far inward as possible as long as the workpiece will fit because you don't want them uh, extending out any farther than necessary because they, come a little, they become a little bit of a safety hazard as the chuck spins around. So if you can uh, keep them in tighter so they're not projecting out from the edge of the chuck, that makes the whole thing a little safer.